Okay, well, the uh, present moment is upon us to uh, begin, and since this talk is about uh, trading present things for future things, well, uh, as all action is uh, done in the present, we'll begin now. Uh, so up to this point, we've talked a lot about, uh, during the week, uh, you know, in different talks, so we've discussed uh, a lot about valuing and the principles behind valuing and imputation of value and so on, and uh, how uh, this leads to an arrangement of production and consumption, and, uh, and then uh, the principle of uh, appraisement, uh, the pricing of things, and then how this leads to economic calculation and how the economizing uh, structure of action that we can see uh, from uh, thinking about Caruso can be applied to society at large. And so we, we have a, a genuine human society, right? We have a we have a social order that operates on the same principle as each individual person. We're, we're economizing together in this cooperative endeavor. <clears throat> now, the one thing we haven't, and uh, uh, there have been some um, uh, discussion of the implications of the, uh, of the uh, importance of time in action, especially with uh, business cycle theory. So you've been exposed a little bit to that, right? Uh, but this talk is going to be about um, time itself. The, the valuing of our action with respect to time. Now, uh, it's important that, and, and we'll, uh, we'll do valuing and then we'll do the uh, pricing, right? So, so just in the same way that we've been proceeding all along in, in the development of economic theorizing. So how do we value our action with respect to time? What's the logic behind economizing and valuing things? And then how does this lead to prices? How does this... Uh, what, what manifestations do we have in the market of this uh, valuing process? <clears throat> so first, we want to start with a distinction between two different ways in which we value our action with respect to time. This is the crucial uh, point uh, from which uh, the, the uh, confusion that exists in this area uh, can be dispelled. <clears throat> Now I get uh, most of this, uh, by the way, from uh, Frank Fetter. So if you uh, if you're interested in reading. Uh, you know, on on uh, time preference and and uh, and what Fetter called time value, this distinction that I'm going to make next, uh, he would be the primary source for this. But you find this sort of thing a, a little less clearly in Mises and and uh, in Rothbard. <clears throat> okay, so Fetter uh, uh, points out that there are two different senses in which we value our action with respect to time. One he ca calls time value and one he calls time preference. <clears throat> time value refers to what I call the temporal aspect of action, or what uh, might be more plainly uh, referred to as the timing of action. So if we think about uh, you know, particular actions that we can take, it's quite obvious that one of the choice uh, parameters that we have is when we take the action, the timing of it. Should we take it today or tomorrow or uh, you know, this morning or this afternoon? And of course, for some actions, it may not matter uh, with respect to the value that we get from the action when we take it. There may be actions like that. But then there are other actions for which timing uh, affects the value uh, that, we, that accrues to us. So to just uh, use a mundane example, uh, my wedding anniversary is November 17th. So on November 17th, 2015, my wife and I will have been married 32 years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Those, th those applause, of course, are for her. <laughs> to, to put, up with, put up with me for 32 years. But, um, uh, but, but to the example, uh, you know, so we'll have, a, we'll have a wedding anniversary, we'll celebrate our wedding anniversary, right, and maybe I get her a bouquet of roses, or we do a, you know, romantic honeymoon uh, type getaway or something of the sort. But if we do it on November 17th, it has a certain value to us that it wouldn't have if we did it on August 1st. Right? It just would, you know, if I went to her and I said, hey, let's, let's celebrate our anniversary uh, next week, <laughs> you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be the same, right? It, it just has more value depending on when we take it. And, and if, heaven forbid, I, I, you know, said, I forgot and then said, oh, <laughs> let's do a, you know, our anniversary on December 2nd, <laughs> you know, the value would be <laughs> greatly diminished. So, so it's easy to think of cases like this, right? We, we, we understand, as soon as we say, hopefully we expose this idea, we, we see that this is so. 
<laughs> so, so naturally, when we can economize then our action with respect to its timing, that's, that would be one element then of economizing because we always aim uh, to take an action that gives us a great, the greater value, right? So, so timing becomes important. And this is a temporal, uh, again, what I call a temporal aspect of action. <clears throat> okay, now, now how does this, uh, how does this uh, manifest itself in, in uh, pricing and appraisement in the market? Well, uh, timing of, uh, uh, the, the different value that we have on the timing of action will be manifest in the market in forward prices. <clears throat> forward prices uh, occur when parties today, trading partners today, have different expectations of what the price of some good will be at some point uh, in the future. Say, the price of oil six months from today. So because they have different anticipations of what the future price will be, there, there can be mutually advantageous trade between them because they, they have different values of the thing, right? And so people can today, these two parties can today, agree to trade six months in the future at a price they specify today. And that price that they specify today for the, for the trade that they'll do six months from today is called a forward price. And some of you know about financial markets, and, and there'll be some lectures on financial markets uh, uh, this week as well. Uh, Guido Holtzman uh, will do these uh, talks, and he'll talk more about this. We're not going to talk about that because this talk is about the rate of interest right, and not about forward prices. But I mentioned this because it, this, again, is a very important distinction to make. There's, there's a difference between acting in the market uh, on the basis of our uh, expectations of the, of the value of something with respect to its temporal placement. Will oil be worth more six months from today than it is today or a year from today than it is from today and so on? Now, when, when people trade with respect to that, they're not engaged in uh, setting an interest rate. The price with respect to this element of valuing their action with respect to time <clears throat> is uh, entirely different. Well, well I mean, everything's related in the economy, but, it, but it's a different kind of price, right? A forward price. Now, uh, just one uh, last point about this. Forward prices then provide an increase in the efficiency of temporal allocation. Just like all prices uh, provide us with a you know, better economic calculation by which we can then economize our actions more fully. So if the, uh, let's say, if the uh, forward price for oil six months from today, uh, let's say today, the, the forward price for trading six months from today increases, well then uh, we, we have uh, an economic, a better economic calculation as to what the uh, traders in this market are anticipating the temporal value of the thing to be. And, and therefore, we can shift the oil from its use today to its use six months from today and gain uh, an economizing move, right? So, so that, that's where this all comes in. And again, Guido Holtzman will speak more to this uh, later in the week. Okay, so now let's turn uh, our attention to the to our topic, our main topic, which is uh, uh, the interest rate. And here, uh, as we mentioned already, and you're familiar with this, uh, Fetter uses the, the, for the valuing here, he uses the phrase time preference. And time preference refers to the intertemporal aspect of action, as opposed to the temporal. Temporal refers to timing. Intertemporal refers to trading present for future, which is not the same thing. They, they sound kind of similar, but they're actually quite distinct. And so uh, uh, if we think about the, the valuing with respect to intertemporal matters, uh, then we can define time preference. And uh, Fetter uh, defines time preference uh, in, this fac in this fashion. It's a preference for a person to have a given satisfaction sooner as opposed to the same satisfaction later. <clears throat> So notice it's defined in terms of value. A given value, a person always prefers to obtain sooner as opposed to later. Now, Mises points out, Fetter didn't uh, work uh, uh, this out fully with respect to the, uh, the integration of this notion into, into value theory. That was uh, Mises' work uh, later. Mises points out that this, this idea of time preference is a fundamental praxeological concept of acting. 
This is not a psychological notion. It's not that we're impatient or, or that we have physiological needs that we need to satisfy in the present or something like that. Those are all also features of acting. But time preference is uh, something uh, in addition to that. Just like preference is. Just like preference itself. <clears throat> so Mises puts it this way. He says, you know, because we're finite beings and, and we always have ends that are unmet because we're, we're incapable of engaging in sufficient production to satisfy all of our ends, because of that, we always prefer more to less, right? We always prefer more goods to fewer goods. This is just a proxiological necessity of human existence. And so he says that the same then is true uh, of us as temporal beings. Because we're temporal, we always prefer a sooner satisfaction to a later. This is just bound up in the notion of being temporal. Right? So, so this is the, the idea of time preference. Now, if there is time preference in this sense, uh, uh, present satisfaction will always command a premium over the same satisfaction in the future. Right? So we will always prefer the present satisfaction to, to the equivalent future satisfaction. This will be true then every time we engage in time-bound action, every time we give up something in the present to gain something in the future, then time preference will be in play and we will always discount the future value right? or place a premium on the present value that we're giving up. So this is the idea. It doesn't matter whether this is a loan contract or someone's giving up present money the lender, and then being paid back future money uh, uh, from the borrower, or uh, production, where, where, the, where the saver is investing to buy factors of production, then going through the process of producing, and then earning money in the future with the sale of the output. Right? Time preference would enter into uh, those uh, activities. <clears throat> and all, in fact, all uh, uh, activities where present things are, are given up for future things. So, so time preference is ubiquitous in action, just, just like preference is. Uh, again, you, you can imagine some sorts of actions where we're not trading present for future things. We're just trading present for present things. Okay, so there's no time preference element of that. But uh, for every uh, intertemporal act, uh, there is. <clears throat> okay, so this is the distinction we're trying to make, right? The temporal aspects of action the timing of action, and the forward prices that we mentioned. <laughs> and then this intertemporal uh, aspect. And notice if we have an intertemporal uh, element of action, then we get, as a manifestation of this, what, uh, what Mises like to call the pure rate of interest. <clears throat> so in the market, the appraisement part of, of valuing with respect to uh, the intertemporal dimension of action is the uh, rate of interest. This is the price, then, for the uh, trading of present money for future money. <clears throat> okay, now, uh, in the next step, let's just uh, provide some uh, overall uh, integration of uh, this basic idea uh, to what we've uh, done uh, so far. So here's the uh, little schematic that shows the logical structure of the arguments that we've made so far with respect to the prices of uh, consumer goods and producer goods and now the rate of interest. So on the top uh, uh, part of this schematic, uh, we've, we've already seen the argument earlier in the week that people have preferences for different things, let's say for apples, for bags of apples. And because their preferences are reversed, some people prefer the bag of apples to the, the amount of money that is uh, being offered in trade. Some, some people who have the bag of apples prefer the money to the, the apples, so they engage in trade, right? There's demand and supply of the consumer goods, say apples, and then the price of the consumer good emerges to clear the market, right? So, so this is the standard uh, argument that you've seen uh, developed earlier in the week. And then because there is a price for the apples or whatever this consumer good is, there there would be a marginal revenue product that's imputed to the factors of production that produce the apples. So there would be an apple orchard, and the apple orchard would have a certain uh, marginal revenue product. Uh, it, it's generating a certain uh, uh, revenue stream from the apple production, 
right? And so uh, there'd be a demand then that the entrepreneurs would have to, uh, to uh, let's say, lease the apple orchard to obtain that marginal revenue product, that production, and then sell the output uh, to the consumer. And uh, then there would be a, an owner of the, uh, of the uh, 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 apple orchard who would lease the apple orchard, and, and, and then a price would emerge. Right? So there would be rental prices for the factors of production. <clears throat> now, the rental prices of the factors of production have one more element to them, and this is the intertemporal dimension. And this depends whether or not there's an intertemporal uh, element of the pricing of the, of the uh, of factors of production depends upon whether or not the entrepreneur pays in advance. So if uh, the apple orchard owner gets his payment from the entrepreneur in advance of the harvesting of the apples and the sale of the apples, then the entrepreneur is uh, lending money up front, right? He's sacrificing present money in order to obtain future money. And the, and the apple orchard uh, owner is receiving the, the loan, if you will. He's receiving the present money up front. So that, that investment would have to command a rate of interest. Of course, the, uh, the entrepreneur could form a contract with the, uh, with the apple orchard owner uh, for the apple orchard owner to be paid the marginal revenue product uh, upon the sale of the apples in the future, in other words, in which case there would be no discounting of the, of the rental price. So that, that just depends, right? So this is the pure rate of interest that would enter into the rental price of the factors of production if money is being advanced to the owners of the factors of production. If workers are being paid their wages in advance of the sale of the output, if uh, you know, other capital uh, goods producers are being paid, like a Michelin produces tires and they sell the tires to Honda, if Michelin is paid up front, then the payment that they get would be discounted, the discounted marginal revenue uh, product of the, the value of the tires to the car. If they wait until the car is sold to be paid, well, then they get the full marginal revenue product, right? So, so that's the integration point of uh, the time preference uh, element uh, with the prices of other things. And then the capital value, the capital value of the orchard, the apple orchard, to go back to my example here, uh, the price of buying the orchard outright would then be the, the stream of all the future discounted marginal revenue products that could be earned from owning the apple orchard. And so that's where we get capital value uh, uh, in our schematic. That's our explanation of where capital value comes from. Now, we're not so concerned with these elements. Again, uh, Guido Holtzman will talk more about these because these are the basis of financial markets. We, we want to look more at the at the uh, bottom line schematic. And here, uh, notice what we're arguing is uh, different people would have different rates of time preference. Some would uh, be more eager to have present satisfaction and some are less eager to have present satisfaction. And so they can engage in mutually advantageous trade. The, the low time preference individuals can lend to the high time preference individuals at a mutually agreeable interest rate. And then as trade, uh, you, you know, as uh, these different uh, p persons come into markets and begin to uh, interact with each other, uh, the interest rate will adjust to clear the market. So again, this is just a standard uh, analysis that we would have. Um, but you'll notice the one, the one point we want to stress is that, and, and you know this just by your own experience, just your own uh, superficial sort of common experience with uh, lending and borrowing. Lending and borrowing is done in money. It's not done in kind. People don't make contracts to lend and borrow in apples or in uh, factories or in uh, apple orchards or uh, uh, you know dress shoes or think right. We we lend and borrow in money, and that, that's very important <laughs> to this whole analysis. It clears up all sorts of uh, difficulties in this in this area of time preference uh, theory. <clears throat> Okay, so we can uh, picture this, uh, we, we call this the time market, where all the uh, uh, lending of present money and the borrowing of present money takes place. Uh, so as we, uh, our terminology is we have some people with higher time preference rates. These people are more uh, eager to uh, have their present satisfactions uh, gratified. And then there are other people with lower time preference who are less eager to have present gratification. And the high time preference people are willing to pay premiums 
that the low time preference people are willing to accept. The borrowers are willing to pay premiums that the lenders are willing to accept. And this premium is the rate of interest, the extra money, right, that's paid when the premium, uh, when the principal of the loan is paid back. <clears throat> okay, so that rate of interest is set by, uh, by the, the uh, time preference, the underlying time preferences of people, so that the uh, market for uh, the exchange of present money for future money clears. That, that's how the interest rate uh, comes about. That's what the interest rate is. <clears throat> and we'll talk uh, in the second part of the talk, we'll talk about the critics of this view, right? So here we're just sort of laying out what, the, what this view is. <clears throat> okay, now let's dwell just a little bit on this uh, point about money. Why is the, this trade of present, uh, uh, why is the intertemporal trade done uh, with uh, money in, instead of goods? So now we, we need to hearken back to this distinction we made before about the difference between time value, the timing of action, and the temporal aspect and the intertemporal. If people engaged in intertemporal trade of apples with apples or with dress shoes or with oil or something else, then there would necessarily be a mixture in the price between the timing element and the intertemporal, the time preference element. So if, if people lent and borrowed an oil, then they would have to worry both about what's, what will be the, the actual market price of oil six months from now when I pay the loan back, and what, what is my intertemporal time preference discount of the future value of the thing. Right? Those two things would be mixed together right, in their trade. <clears throat> now with money, those two things are not mixed together. With money, uh, we can isolate, if you will, uh, the time preference element from the timing element. And this happens uh, it, it, perhaps the most succinct way that I can put this is uh, as follows. <clears throat> money, as you've learned already, is the unit in which economic calculation is conducted. And this unit of money is equally serviceable across all goods, right? At any point in the present, any I can use any particular unit of money to make my exchange. It's, it's interchangeably useful. It doesn't matter if I spend it on apples or on men's dress shoes or on gasoline or anything else. I'm holding the medium of exchange, and, and every unit of it is equally serviceable with every other unit. This is also true intertemporally. That, that's the point. It's also true intertemporally. That money has a value as a medium of exchange, and the unit of it today to people has exactly the same interchangeably useful uh, aspect to it, whether they're going to trade it intertemporally or whether they trade it uh, in the present for goods in the present. And so the unit of money does not have a timing element in it. It doesn't have a time value in it. It, 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 it is the unit in which economic calculation is done, even if the calculation is intertemporal. So this is what Fetter was getting at. This is, this is his insight. Uh, and so he explains exactly why it is that, um, that all uh, intertemporal trade is done in money and not in goods, not in kind. So now we've isolated the, the uh, time preference element in the rate of interest. And there's no timing aspect uh, here uh, in, the, in the rate of interest at all. This is, this is uh, Fetter's position. Okay, now the next thing we, we need to do before we turn to the, to the issue of the critics of this uh, uh, argument of the pure time preference theory is make one more distinction in the time market between credit markets and the capital structure. So I alluded to this before. When people uh, lend uh, present money in, in exchange for the anticipation of getting money in the future paid back to them, they can do this in a credit transaction, in, in a loan contract, or they can do it through production, through, through, in other words, through the capital structure. And notice uh, if all of the things are the same with respect to these different alternatives of just lending to somebody or in, investing in inputs in order to get output, if, if uh, you know, the riskiness of the different projects and so on are roughly the same, then uh, it wouldn't matter uh, what a person invested in as a saver it would command the same interest uh, premium, right? It would command the same rate of return. 
as long as long as the other aspects of the uh, investable projects were considered by the uh, saver investor to be to be uh, the same. We'll, we'll talk in a minute about what happens if they're different. But if they're considered to be the same, then arbitrage would, would uh, equate the rate of return on investing in the capital structure, investing in production processes, or just lending people money, you know, lending a consumer money on a mortgage and the consumer pays back, or lending on credit card uh, fu- uh, uh, purchases and, and then the funds are paid back and so on. <clears throat> so there's one sense in which we get a uniform, pure rate of interest across all uh, lending of present money to be paid back for future money. <clears throat> Notice that there are important implications of this. One implication of this, and, and this bears upon the critics of uh, this view, is that production is not necessary to generate interest. Right? <laughs> we get interest in credit markets. There's no production there. It's just, it's just a you know, homeowner who wants to borrow on a mortgage, and there's no production. He's just, he's just paying back the interest out of his income. He's not, he's not engaged in a production process, right? Uh, like an entrepreneur is. So we can clearly have interest without production. And then the other thing to note about this is even in production, we don't have to have interest. Uh, this is what I mentioned before. If entrepreneurs and the owners of the factors of production that entrepreneurs are hiring agree uh, on a contract for the payment of wages and so on that stipulates that the workers will be paid when the goods are sold instead of in advance, then there would be no interest. No interest would accrue to the entrepreneur because he's not acting as a capitalist. He's not saving and investing. So notice interest is only paid for the value uh, that's, that, that accrues to the borrower for advancing the borrower toward his end in time. Right? It's, only, it's only accruing for that benefit, for satisfying time preference. Okay, this is the argument of the pure time preference theory. Okay, now just again for clarity, let, let's talk about the other, what I've called here, components of the market rate of interest. So we have the pure rate of interest, this, this we've talked about, this is the pure, uh, the pure rate of interest, the time preference, this is uh, determined by the time preference alone. <clears throat> but we know uh, from just cursory observation of markets that different investable projects actually command different rates of return, different interest rates. Interest rates are higher on credit card uh, lending than on mortgages and so on. <clears throat> well, that's because there's an, there's an element of uh, differential entrepreneurial risk or uncertainty involved in the different lending projects. Right? So even though uh, you know, credit card interest rates are higher than mortgage rates, it's not that they're earning, the investors are earning different pure rates of interest. Uh, the the uh, credit card uh, lender the lender into the credit card market, is simply earning a a risk premium. He's earning the pure rate of interest plus a risk premium because, well, he's not going to be paid back as often, right? The default's higher, and he's got all the costs of uh, trying to get the money back and so on and so forth. Uh, There's also a price premium that can emerge in uh, market rates of interest. So market rates of interest are a complex of different causal factors. There's a pure... Uh, the, the pure element, the time preference element. There's riskiness. There's a price premium. We see the price premium, by the way, working right now in uh, Silicon Valley and in uh, the housing market in San Francisco and, and so on. Right? The Fed is regenerating uh, the, the boom process through its monetary inflation. And this creates the Cantillon effects. It creates a differential movements in asset prices. And so some people have invested in these projects before the process begins and they get an extra premium, right? The, the, if you would have invested in San Francisco real estate, uh, you know, five years ago, you'd be reaping a greater return, not just the pure rate of interest plus whatever risk uh, is associated with that kind of investment, but you'd be earning this price premium, right? So that's another element. Uh, the pure, uh, in other words, the pure time preference theory is not saying that well, uh, interest rates are, every interest rate is completely determined just by time preference. You're saying that time preference is a, is a fundamental element in all interest returns, but then there are other elements that are, you know, uh, layered on top of time preference. Uh, and then there can be unanticipated changes in the PPM. 
So the purchasing power of money, inflation, and other price inflation could add another element uh, to interest returns. As long as it's unanticipated, people might be investing today in production processes and then inflation occurs and they'll earn a higher nominal return if they don't anticipate it. If, by the way, as Murray Rothbard pointed out, if they anticipate that there, there'll be general price inflation, then the entrepreneurs will invest more heavily in, in inputs today to earn what they perceive as a higher rate of return, and they'll bid up input prices today and they won't, they won't get any higher return. Right? So this has to be unanticipated. Okay, so now let's turn to the, the uh, critics of, uh, of this view. <clears throat> and to do this, we're going to use uh, the pedagogy of uh, uh, Bumba's work. Uh, he set, famously uh, set out what he called the interest rate problem and the interest rate problem, Bumbavrik said, is why is the price of a capital good not bid up by investors to equal the full stream of the marginal revenue products to be earned in the future? So, you know, everybody agrees, all economists agree, it's not uh, that prices aren't bid up that high. Uh, the prime example of this, of course, would be land. If land prices were bid up to capture the full stream of the marginal revenue product in the future, they'd be almost indefinitely high, right? Because, you know, land sites in certain places in the world have been in production for thousands of years and will be in production for thousands of more years. And if you add up all the marginal revenue product, you know, and pay that out today to buy the land, the, you know, the price would be astronomically high. Why don't people do that? Well, because they die, right? As we said before, they're temporal. People are temporal. How much do you, would you pay today to get a, a dollar, you know, 50 years from today? Okay, so not very much, right? even if you're young. And I would pay nothing, <laughs> or almost not. You know, I could, I, could, I could transfer this money maybe to my heirs, but aside from that, it would have no value to me. Right, so that's the interest rate problem. And this is true then of all, of all assets. It's potentially true, at least of all assets. If you calculate the stream of the marginal revenue product that would be generated by a factory over its life, the price entrepreneurs will pay today is less than the sum of that stream. That's the interest rate problem. Why is that so, in other words? What explains that? Okay, well, obviously, the pure time preference theory explains that, uh, as we've already done, right, by, by time preference. So people have a preference for present satisfaction, so they're not willing to uh, pay to get future money an equivalent amount to present money. They discount the future. And they discount it more heavily the further into the future the money is to be received. Right? So. There's a finite value, even of very long-lived uh, assets. Okay, so that's not the only, uh, obviously, the only expo uh, explanation of this. There's also the exploita uh, exploitation theory, and I put this in uh, this order because this is the one that Boombaver famously smashed. <clears throat> this argues that interest is a surplus value that, uh, of labor that's extracted by the capitalists in the, in the uh, uh, wage negotiation process, right? The capitalist is a big and powerful and can uh, uh, rip off the workers by extracting some kind of surplus. Now, as uh, Boombaugh pointed out, of course, this, is, this argument is based on the fallacious labor theory of value. But furthermore, you know, to go beyond that, it, it's also the case that uh, labor is actually paid its full marginal revenue uh, product. It's just that the discount, the surplus, is for lending, the entrepreneur lending to the worker in advance of the sale of the output. So as I put on the PowerPoint slide, labor could receive its full marginal revenue product if it were willing to wait until the output were sold to be paid, or it could do, uh, uh, there's another alternative, right? It could receive its pay right now and then take that pay and lend it out on interest until the goods are sold, and then it would have its full marginal revenue product. So, so, so there is no exploitation, right? There is no, there is no extraction of the value of things that labor has produced by the capitalist. <clears throat> now we come to the productivity theory of interest. It's a little bit more uh, challenging, or at least a little bit more uh, common uh, criticism of the, of the pure time preference theory. So we have a lot of economists who, uh, uh, neoclassical types who uh, hold to this view. And here the argument is that capital, uh, the, these assets generate a flow of productive services. 
And this flow of productive services generates at least a real rate of return. And there are various examples of this uh, that are given in the literature. Um, uh, you know, Frank Knight has uh, the example of the Crutonian plants, and uh, Irving Fisher has this example that I've given on the PowerPoint of sheep. Uh, there are also examples of uh, rice uh, that multiplies and so on. So here we have this idea from Fisher that uh, we have a flock of sheep, 100 sheep, and then just through natural processes, it becomes 110 sheep a year later, and so on, right? Every year, we get 10% more sheep. That's the idea. And, and so he says, look, that's, that's interest. That's a 10% real return. How is that not interest, isn't it? <clears throat> okay, well, uh, the pure time preference theory answer to this is that, it, no, clearly this is not interest. It, this is not what we mean by interest when we uh, use that word. Um, either in common discourse or in our uh, theory. What this is, is physical productivity. This is just physical productivity. Uh, by the way, th these examples, the Crustonian plant and the rice and the sheep and so on, th they're more akin not to assets like uh, factories and, and what have you, but land, right? The, the, the closest analogy we would have in the real world to something like this is land that generates an indefinite physical production every year. But we know that land prices aren't, again, uh, indefinitely large, right? In other words, land prices vary depending upon, despite their physical productivity, they vary depending upon market conditions. And so the rate of return that can be earned on land varies. It just depends upon what the value that people place upon uh, the future revenue stream and their time preference. So this is what I've done in, the, uh, in, in this line here. This, again, is capital value. And remember, this is an indefinite production process. And so those of you who have uh, you know, seen capital value calculations, uh, you know how this works. And the rest of you are just going to have to take my word for this and do a little uh, extra study to get up to speed on this. But the capital value, the, the asset value, for an indefinite uh, period of time for an asset is its marginal revenue product, whatever it generates every year in revenue, just divided by the interest rate. If you have a, if you have a time-bound asset, you would have to sum all this up over the over the life of the asset. But if it's indefinitely extended, like the like the sheep herd, or or land again, then then it's just simple. The calculation is simple. It just reduces to this. But you'll notice that the rate of return that's earned on on this investment, if you're going to buy this asset, uh, depends upon the prices, right? <clears throat> And the prices aren't uh, fixed. Even though the physical productivity in this example is fixed, every year we get 10 more sheep. The market price of that output is not fixed. Neither is the market price of the flock of sheep. It's not fixed, right? Just like the market process, uh, price excuse me, of, a, of bushels of wheat produced on land is not fixed. Neither is the price of the land. So as long as we have trade in these things, then the prices will adjust so that the uh, rate of return earned by investing in this project is the pure rate of interest, the same as the rate of return on any investable project. So it works, uh, let's say in my first example, where we have a 10% time preference rate, it does work out the way that the, the, the uh, proponents of this uh, example would suggest. You would earn, in fact, a 10% monetary return then by investing in this uh, flock of sheep. But if the time preference rate were 5%, and uh, investors could spend $100 to get a 10% return every year, but the time preference, the going rate of interest in the market were 5%, then they'd flock to uh, buy this, buy the sheep. They'd bid the price of sheep up, and the price would be bid up to $200 so that this investment would command the same rate of return as every other investment, right? So again, productivity alone does not generate <coughs> rates of interest. It's, productivity generates marginal revenue product. <laughs> but the rate of interest is determined by time preference. Okay, so productivity is not, uh, a, again, a very uh, successful uh, criticism. Uh, it, for, for a further study, by the way, you can think through, I don't have time to go into these other alternatives, but you can think through the logic of them. Uh, Fisher gives us sheep, the, the case we've taken, hardtack. This is a case where there's no productivity. Productivity is zero. The hardtack just stays indefinitely in a fixed supply and figs that deteriorate, negative productivity. 
And he would say in the Figs case, the rate of interest would be negative. But, but hopefully you can see right away that actually if you had fig, if you had a pr production process where the physical output was negative, you were destroying things in the production process, then you wouldn't invest in it. <laughs> right? you, no one would invest in this, right? And, and so there would be no rate of return at all. So, so you can work through the logic of the different cases uh, on your own, I think. Uh, there's an eclectic theory. This, again, is a fairly standard neoclassical theory that says uh, time preferences and productivity of capital jointly determine the interest rate. It's kind of a Marshallian uh, sort of argument. And uh, you may have been uh, exposed already to the uh, critique that Austrians give of the Marshallian uh, analysis. Uh, they point out that, uh, I think uh, Professor Salerno mentioned, that cost of production are just prices that are determined by imputation of the value of consumer goods. So, so, so right, we have the same problem here, right? In other words, uh, productivity of capital or technical factors of the world cannot be independent determinate causes of human action. What really happens is we have to perceive these things and then judge them and then choose with respect to them. But they don't somehow uh, force us. They don't de determinist deterministically, independent of our will and valuing and choosing, uh, do anything and uh, you know, have any effect in the economy. So productivity, if we take productivity to mean just physical productivity, then this is wrong. It violates the ends means causal chain. Means cannot determine the value of things independently, but only as aids to the end. And if by productivity of capital, this is meant a value productivity, well, then, then this is the fallacy of the vicious circle, right? Because as we already showed, the value of productive factors, in fact, depends upon the rate of interest. And so you're, this is just the circular reasoning. <clears throat> okay, what about Boombav work? The Boombav work is a little bit more sophisticated than the eclectic, uh, this eclectic theory, but it uh, has similar defects. What the Boombav work says is that, yes, you, like, like we had before, like the pure time preference theory, we have time preferences determining demand and supply, but not of present money, instead present goods. Present goods traded for future goods. And then... The premium of present goods relative to future goods is the rate of interest. This is his argument, slightly different. You know, it appears slightly different. <clears throat> and then he, then he points out something that's entirely different from the pure time preference theory. He says, we know uh, logically, analytically, what determines time preferences. Th this, again, is like saying we can have a logical... Uh, absolute structure of analytical explanation of what determines people's preferences. See, we, we as Austrians would reject that notion. We, do, we don't know what determines people's preferences. You know, all sorts of different things influence our preferences, right? But we don't, we don't have any sort of determined theory of why a person has the preferences they have. We start with preferences. We start with preferences as a given because the logic can flow from there inexorably to uh, the outcomes in the market, but we're at a loss to say anything scientifically about how various influences deterministically uh, impact our preferences. So this is, but this is what Boombaverk claims: uh, the value productivity of capital. Notice this. This is what he calls an objective factor, but as we've already pointed out, this objective factor suffers from the, the vicious circle. If it's value productivity, then the value of the productivity. It already incorporates an interest rate. And so you're saying the interest rate is necessary to determine the interest rate. This is no good, right? This is not logically acceptable. <clears throat> and the subjective factors, again, are, are elements that uh, are just psychological or you know, not praxeological. So maybe they exist, maybe they don't. But this doesn't really give us a logical theory uh, of the interest rate. Now I'm going to skip over the weighting theory and uh, move to uh, the, the modern critics, uh, uh, Dr. Murphy and uh, Dr. Holtzman. And they have both made uh, very uh, pointed uh, criticisms of the way that uh, this theory has been developed, the, the semantic way in which it's been expressed, I should say, in Mises and Rothbard. And it's very uh, poignant uh, uh, criticisms that they make that I think uh, our uh, Fetter's uh, development of the theory can... Um, uh, uh, clear up. 
So anyway, uh, uh, Dr. Murphy says, there seems to be a dilemma in the two different ways that time preference is defined in the, in the literature. Sometimes it's defined as a present satisfaction, as we pointed out. And uh, he says, if that's the case, of course, time preference would then ensure a premium of the present. So, so just the argument we made before. But that, he claims, has no connection to intertemporal trade, at least not of goods. And then he says, if we define, uh, as Boom Bavert does, if we define time preference in terms of present goods, then uh, time preference uh, that, defined that way ensures that there's inter, a connection to intertemporal trade, but we're not really sure when we trade goods intertemporally that there'll be a premium of the present. And he's absolutely right about that. So, so he, he's correct in what he says here. But hopefully you see already that uh, Fetter's uh, line of argument uh, avoids this dilemma. It avoids the dilemma by pointing out, once again, that intertemporal trade is always in money. It's never in goods. It's always in money. And money isolates the time preference element. And therefore, we don't have this dilemma. We can avoid it. Right? Uh, and then the second point that he makes is similar. He says time preference as a satisfaction is neither necessary uh, uh, nor sufficient for the positive premium. This is because, again, the marginal utility of a good in the present could exceed the marginal utility of the good in the future, or vice versa, right? <laughs> but again, ho hopefully you can see right away that this is true of goods. Dr. Murphy's correct. This is true of goods. But it's not true of money. And therefore, if intertemporal trade is always done in money, then the pure time preference theory is free of this uh, criticism. Now, Dr. Holtzman uh, has a, a similar kind of uh, argument. It's different in structure, but it's uh, similar uh, in style anyway. He says the uh, pure time preference theory literature contains two contradictory claims. One is that a larger stock of a future good is preferred to a smaller stock of a present good. And, and that's why time preference is necessary to explain why we take the present. <laughs> because more is preferred to less. We would always take the future if future goods were preferred to uh, present goods, right? And then he says the second claim is that a good in the present is a different good than the good in the future. So you find this expression in Mises and uh, sometimes in Rothbard. And then he, he concludes from this, quite rightly, he concludes from this that if the second claim is true, the first, of course, is not certain, right? If they're different goods, then we're not really certain that that future goods, you know, uh, uh, we're comparing apples and apples with future goods and present goods. So, so he's quite correct. But again, hopefully you can see right away that this, this problem is completely avoided once we recognize that intertemporal trade is never in goods, it's always in money. And, and so again, this problem is avoided, is simply uh, bypassed, right? Uh, by recognizing that the, the temporal trade is goods. And then he gives one, one last uh, uh, point that, uh, again, we can address in the same way. He says, time preference is between two options of choice for the same good. And he says, this is Mises' view, right? A present good and a future, uh, 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 an option for the uh, exact same good, whatever it is, let's say an apple or whatever it is. But he points out that in the same literature, the, the pure rate of interest is always expressed as uh, the relationship between present goods and future goods. Not necessarily the same goods, like inputs and outputs, right? And so again, this seems problematic. But again, this uh, criticism, uh, I think, is bypassed once we recognize that it is the same good. It's money. It's not, it's not literally present goods, like inputs and outputs. It's present money that's used to buy the inputs, and it's future money that's, that's uh, received from the sale of the output. That's what's being traded, the money, not the goods themselves, right, but the money. Okay, at this point, I'll, uh, I'll uh, desist. <laughs> so thank you.